Welcome to a revival of Azure Automation session. Uh, alternative title could be Rebirth of Azure Automation as well. That's one of the uh, services that look almost dead a couple of years ago, or at least in hibernation, infinitive coma, just put it like whatever you want. Uh, we really thought that uh, uh, Microsoft kind of uh, gave up on it. And uh, uh, for years, people were struggling to see the future and what Microsoft's vision of it, especially when Microsoft introduced PowerShell support in Azure Functions. And uh, lots of people kind of migrated to Azure Functions. Also, I think that uh, uh, there is still place for both of those uh, services and you need kind of a, to, to pick the right tool for the right task kind of thing. And Azure Functions always had that uh, aura of being something for developers more than for IT pros. And I'm thinking that the, for IT pros, the Azure Automation is probably the easiest service to move from your scripting on premises resources to managing cloud resources for everyone. My name is Alexander Nikolic. I'm a PowerShell and Azure trainer. I'm also Cloud and Data Center Management MVP and Microsoft Azure MVP. I like to joke that I'm a hybrid MVP because I'm covering private and public cloud. But now they have some subcategory now, hybrid MVPs for people that are dealing with uh, Azure Stack and uh, Azure Arc and those kind of things. I'm one of the co-founders of PowerShellMagazine.com, uh, the site that it's quite silent for a couple of years now. So people ask me, why is that the case? And the short answer is life happened. So some people got babies, some people got new jobs, some people got new wives, so, you know, things changed. <clears throat> I'm active on uh, Twitter, usually tweeting about technical stuff and not anything personal there. And uh, we will see what will happen. And now I see the people are migrating to a blue sky and a mastodon and all that. So uh, for now, I'm on Twitter still, but we will see how it will go. So when we, uh, just to kind of set a stage for Azure Automation for people that haven't heard about the service or haven't used the service, uh, there are kind of three broad areas. Here. First, uh, how many of you are users of Azure Automation? Okay, half of you. How many of you never heard about it? Okay. So when we talk about uh, automating cloud operation, uh, operations, we talk about like three different areas there. Deploy and manage, which is probably the, the most common one. Response, when you react on a certain events that are happening. And orchestrate, when we talk about integration between different services inside of uh, Azure or third-party services. So when we think about services that can cover the uh, automation of deployment and management, First, you think about ARM templates, no? JSON or BICEP-based. We started with JSON, now the, base, uh, the BICEP is new kids on the block, and uh, probably also the uh, thing that we should use in the future. We have Azure Blueprints with a kind of uncertain uh, future. We have Azure Automations here as well. And to a certain extent, you can use uh, Azure Auto Manage with the machine configuration there for people that are not Familiar with the Azure Auto Manage uh, service? That service that Microsoft created using all the best practices from the field and created something that can help, especially small shops, to have a properly, according to best practices, configured environment. Okay? Part of it is a machine configuration. So if you heard previously the name Azure Policy Get. Azure Policy Guest Configuration. The new name is Auto Manage Machine Configuration, right? Uh, marketing needs to get some paychecks as well. So, you know, every couple of years, new names. 
for responding to external events, first you think about Azure Functions, really, right? Because that's event-driven automation there. But Azure Automation has its own place there as well because it can react on a webhooks. And you can actually, we'll see during one of the demos, one of those things when it's happening that something outside of Azure uh, is going on, but then it triggers the execution of the runbook in Azure Automation. Automation machine configuration can also be considered here for like a, a service that acts on event in event of a drift. So if you configure the environment to react on a drift, then, you know, it's based on a DSC, so the change will happen there as well, right? If it goes out of a compliance state and those kind of things. Then if we think about orchestration and integration with the Azure resources and the third party resources, very often first people think about Azure Logic Apps, right? But Azure Logic Apps contains a number of different connectors and some of them are nicely work with Azure Functions in Azure Automation. So as you can see, Azure Automation has its own place here as well, right? So it's quite interesting that for a service that was almost dying, we have Azure Automation almost everywhere, right? And what really is kind of a puzzling me is that uh, what is the driver for all that change? And I think that the uh, Azure uh, Arc for, for enabled servers played a great role there. Arc enabled servers is the way how you will onboard on-premises AWS or Google Cloud VMs and also bare metal services on-premises to Azure, okay? So that you, you can use the Azure management tools to manage non-Azure resources, okay? And once when you connect them, you can very easily onboard them to Azure Automation. So that's why they now need a pretty robust Azure Automation service. And I kind of think that's my opinion that that's probably the main driver why we see this change now. So what is Azure Automation? Azure Automation is the oldest automation service in Azure, okay? And it was serverless before that term was in. No one called it serverless at that time, but if you go today to Azure Automation documentation, one of the first terms that you will see in the first sentence is serverless because it's a kind of a hip word now, right? I like to call it PowerShell as a service because this is how it started. It supported PowerShell workflows. Do we have anyone in a room that use PowerShell workflows? Wow, okay, that's expected. We have, we got two hands up and mine would be the third. I even delivered trainings about it, if you can imagine. Uh, no one liked them. And the reason why people didn't like them was they were too complex. Like seriously, too complex. And that's the main reason why people didn't like them. So when people started using Azure Automation Service for the first time, the first request immediately was please enable just simple PowerShell scripts to run in this service instead of forcing us to deal with the limitations of workloads and complexity of workloads. So we have those PowerShell scripts there and then later they added support for Python as well. Probably they will in the future add support for some other stuff too. So we will see how that will go. Uh, the terminology is also for people that never use this service. Uh, I will call, I will use the term runbook. And runbook is practically a script. Why they didn't use a term script and use the term runbook? To make it similar to the orchestrator, right? Orchestrator had runbooks, so they wanted to make that parallel because they wanted to move people from on-premises orchestrator 
to cloud-based Azure automation. Okay? That's also a reason why they introduced graphical runs and just wasted their time and our time. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, Azure Automation uh, delivers a, a cloud-based automation, right? Everything happens in the cloud. Uh, you can use so-called, and that's the main point of it, process automation when you actually run those partial scripts. But at certain point of uh, development, they added support for updates, for change tracking, for inventory. And what's happening today is that they are decoupling Azure Automation Service from those other services. They also added Azure Automation State Configuration it used to be called Azure Automation Desired State Configuration, but they didn't change the name again, remember marketing. So now they are kind of removing that as well, and there is a need to migrate to auto-manage machine configuration, which is a new thing for Microsoft for actually applying configurations to your machine, okay? So don't invest to Azure Automation State Configuration, right? That's thing of the past. If you have it already and you use it, Look at the migration options, and they are not easy. Very well documented, but not very easy, to be honest. So, how I see Azure Automation in a year or two years is that it will be purely for process automation, for running Runbox. This is how it started, made a full circle with all these additional things that we didn't understand, why are they actually part of the service? And now they are going only to a pure Rumbox. Probably with extending support for different languages that you can use to write Rumbox, which is a good decision. Everyone would like to see, for example, support for Azure CLI. That would make pure sense to me, right? Because there is a lot of people now using in parallel Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. They are both created with the same purpose, but as you know, the coverage is not identical. So very often, you are forced to pick one or another. It's not just that you prefer one or another, but you are actually forced for certain services to pick one or another, right? So if you manage, for example, the Kubernetes service, Azure CLI is the right tool for it. Why? Because PowerShell is still a little bit behind, right? Doesn't support all the services. So if we get this support in Azure Automation, that would be well win. So I got this image from official Azure Automation documentation. As you can see here, a uh, couple of those things will probably kind of be removed or just kept for a backward compatibility kind of thing without new development, like configuration management, update management here. And we will have a process automation as the main thing supporting Windows and Linux, and providing the integration with other services. So that part will still stay, but the other services will kind of uh, go away from uh, Azure Automation, or just be in hibernation, like the whole service was up to the last year kind of thing. So one of the, uh, there are a couple of requests that users really uh, wanted Azure Automation team uh, to kind of build for us and, and to add some new features and to kind of be modern, right? That's one of the terms now that are super popular, like modernizing things, really, right? They all like to modernize stuff, right? But what's modern today will not be modern tomorrow, really, right? Recently, I heard that Microsoft is working on some feature and it will be called modern something. So I asked them, like, and the next version will be what? more modern something, <laughs> right? So Azure Automation right now support AZ modules. That was one of the biggest blocker for users of Azure Automation, right? Because we couldn't use the Azure PowerShell AZ modules, right? That was a huge problem. So new automation accounts, the emphasis is here on the new. Include the latest version of AZ modules. No, I'm joking. Not latest. It's 8.0.0. The latest is 9.6. So it's good that we have them. 
It's not that they are latest. And I will show you that even the update doesn't work for some reason. But there is uh, obviously an effort from Azure Automation team to fix that and to enable us to have access to the latest versions or to the very current versions of AZ in the future. They're changing some uh, things in the background that will allow us to kind of a better follow the development of AZ, probably similar to how Cloud Shell, with a little bit of delay, updates all the time on a monthly basis, right? I don't know if you know, but uh, the Azure PowerShell release new version every month, okay? And it's kind of now in sync with Azure CLI, so on the same day, if everything is okay, they will both release a new release. Okay. So in Portal, you actually have update as in modules option that should enable you to update uh, AZ modules, but you will see, at least for, for me, and I created completely new automation account to have all the latest features for you for the demos. Um, you will see how it behaves, really, and what's happening there. So if I go to automation accounts, I have one here for a PowerShell Summit, and I will show you how the modules look like. And there is one thing that I will talk soon, just after this, is that now they also support new runtimes. Not just 5.1, but also 7x. And because of that, you now need to make a connection between the modules and the runtime, okay? So if you have AZ modules for 5.1, Point one, which means that the Windows PowerShell will run those AZ commandlets, but you want to run it in 7.1, you also need to have AZ modules installed for the runtime 7.1, okay? It's not enough because if you know, even locally, right? You have on a Windows machine, a Windows PowerShell by default, you install PowerShell 7. If you want to use Azure PowerShell in both of them, do you need to install twice? The answer is yes. Same thing here, okay? You cannot have it just once. You need to tie it to the runtime, okay? So as you can see here, we have AZ80451, and then I think on the next page, we have AZ80 for a 71. Okay? The thing is that if you go to update AZ modules, it, they told us that we can use it to update, right? So you would say, like, okay, I get 8 by default, but maybe I can update to the latest. Unfortunately, the highest that it's offered is actually the one that it's installed by default. So I cannot install newer version for it. What I tried here, and you can try it by yourself, and maybe uh, you will have a better luck than me. You can go to add module, browse gallery, and then try to fetch it from a gallery. And on gallery, the latest version is 9.6.0, which is really interesting that we don't get that data here as well, as well, right? No information about version, right? Like, how is that useful? Why should I care about the date? Who can remember the date when the things are released or uploaded to a system, really, right? Give me a number, give me a version, then I will know. So you can select AZ here and try to install it, which I tried and I failed because um, it kind of installed but didn't work. If you see these custom things, that means this is something that I've tried to add to my system. So I added some Microsoft Graph things that I will talk about shortly. But I also tried to install AZ for 7.2. That's another thing that it's in preview. I will talk about it in a minute, really. So I didn't want to jeopardize 7.1. I wanted to say, let me try with the 7.2. And it's installed, but as you can see, the version is not recognized. 
And also what is kind of a problematic here that if you use this add module way to add stuff, it doesn't care about dependencies. So I thought like if I say AZ, it will add everything. But it added only AZ. And then later I added AZ accounts, but you know, just to see if it will be recognized or the version will be unknown. And as you can see, both of them are unknown for some reason, right? So they need to kind of work on this update thing a little, I think. Right? But it's good that we already have something that we can work with, right? We have a new runtime. We have a, at least version 8 that covers a lot, but it will be better. What we have right now is a previous support for 7.1 and 7.2, okay? So, uh, and they cover different regions. They cover the public uh, Azure and the uh, government and also China clouds. Uh, by the way, uh, Azure Automation was not a global service. In the past, they didn't support all regions they have. Today, when they have like, a, I think 65 regions, I'm still not sure if they cover like all 65 of them, but they cover most of them, okay? The partial version is determined by a property called runtime version. So you will see in the process of creating your runbook, when you create a new runbook, you will get additional question, okay, you pick PowerShell, but what is the runtime that you want to use? 5.1, 7.1 preview, 7.2 preview, okay? The same Azure Sandbox and a hybrid runbook workers can execute side by side 5.1 and 7.1. Okay. Similarly, how things work on a local Windows machine. Okay. They also added support in some cases for the runtimes, but not everywhere. No. So, for example, if you use Azure Portal to add the module, there is no way for you to specify a runtime. It goes immediately to 5.1. If you enable connection to GitHub, or a DevOps repo, it will also be synced with a by one. Right now, there is no support. Even in commandlets, there is no support. So, as you see, it's preview, right? And they mark that very clearly, right? They, by the GA, they will need to support that, really, right? So, uh, let me show you how that looks like. If we go first very briefly to a run books and want to create a new run book. This is the new thing, okay? So we get a PowerShell and then we have 7.1 preview and 7.2 preview, okay? What I want to show you is that you need to be careful when you pick a runtime and you execute it on Azure using the Azure sandbox machines, right? Uh, for people that never use uh, Azure Automation before, by default, the Azure provided sandbox machines can run your runbooks, but also you can enable your Azure VM to be a hybrid runbook worker and run your runbooks, or you can enable your on-premises machines or any non-Azure machines to be the Arc enabled server promote it to be a hybrid runbook worker, and then use that machine to run the runbooks that are part of the Azure automation, okay? That gives you kind of a flexibility because you fully control those environments. You can install whatever you want with any method you like, things that, modules that you want on that, those systems, and then just use the Azure automation as a kind of a repository of your scripts that you can run, and also system that provides you encrypted credentials, a scheduler, and a couple of other things, connections to the Azure monitor so that you can monitor the execution of your scripts, find the failing ones, and, and all of that. What I want to show you now is that it's very important to understand the environment that will run your runbooks. 
So when you pick a runtime 7 1, and when you pick a 7 2, they right now target very different environments. Let me show you that. For that, we will need to run uh, a couple of runbooks that I've created. So let me go to runbooks here, and I have here test 7.1. So if I go to 7.1, it's published. I'm targeting Azure, which means the Azure provided setbox machines will run them. And I want to show you how does that look like. What is the actual machine that runs Runbooks? That's important to know, right? Because you want to know the environmental variables. You want to know how the, what are the paths in a PS module path. What is the version of PowerShell 7 that will run them, right? Those are the kind of important things. So I always like in my Azure Automation accounts to have this kind of a script that will give me a little bit of an output that can tell me what's going on there. So as you can see, we have a machine with a 7.1. It's a Windows machine. Uh, interesting paths. Look at this. Those are all the paths in a NPS module path variable. It's very different than your machine, right? So this is where Windows, uh, when PowerShell loops for the modules. Really, right? Lots of them. Very strange. But then, this is a list of environmental variables. And you can see this is a, a Windows kind of virtual machine, like a full Windows machine. That And pay attention to this variable here called PowerShell Distribution Channel. And it's called Azure Automation. OK? I will show you how that looks like for 7.2. And you might be surprised. And I'm not sure the team would like you to see it, but I will anyway show you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, uh, I mean, it's a public thing, really, right? I know some things that I cannot share with you, but uh, this is public. So I just created a, a ROM book that will uh, give us some clue what's going on. And, okay. Let's go here for output. Wait a little. For people that use this service, you might also notice that the execution is much faster now than it used to be, which was not that a problem for running things in a production when, when you are done, but it was so painful for testing because for every single test, you needed to wait for a minute or even more sometimes for all those things to warm up and then load everything that it's needed, download the modules that you additionally have and then run stuff. For production, it's not critical. Why? Because mostly people use these scheduling things. So if it really starts in a minute or two minutes, who cares? So here, we get the output for this. And you can see it's using 7.2, Windows. But to look at the first, what you will notice is that the formatting is different. Like it's not that nice as in the first one. You get those black lines. It looks like they're still working on it. So many wasted space here in the output. So those are the paths, very different. Do you see something strange? Backslashes, forward slashes, like two different developers did, and one of them came from Linux. So, uh, and then, interesting thing. When we go to the environmental variables, uh, this channel will be interesting to show you. Let me kind of go there. Look at this. Sandbox container. So they're moving for the VMs to a container, it looks like. And now even better, even bigger surprise, at least for me. Uh, look at this. Look at the name of the image for a container. When was the last time you heard about nano server? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
just a couple of seconds ago to me. Okay, interesting really, right? So it looks like they are making transition to nano servers that are workers inside of the Azure automation service. Interesting. So, as I said, it's important to understand the environment. Right? Because you might see a different results if you target, for example, this or a full VM, right? And <clears throat> it's in preview, so we will see how things will go, but uh, for now it's quite interesting if you ask me that uh, they support that. They also introduced managed support for managed identities for Azure Automation. And that's huge. You might not even kind of be aware how huge that is, but it is. So first, it gives you better security immediately, okay? You can have a system managed, uh, assigned managed identities. You can have user assigned. You can have both. By default, you get a system one, and in the new Azure Automation accounts, you cannot have run as accounts anymore, okay? They will be retired very soon, and you need to migrate your script, which is very easy, practically, because if you used one of the example run books and just copy-pasted the authentication part, you get that in a new one also, and you just need to replace that section with a new one very easy. Seriously, like, that shouldn't be the problem, just updating scripts. But you need to be aware that just support for managed identities is not enough. By default, it doesn't have any rights. So the managed identity needs to get some roles assigned to it so that you can actually run something against your Azure environment, okay? So the first step after creating a new account is to go to identity option and assign some roles, always using the list privilege role. Okay? Don't make it contributor to the subscription. Okay? Try to avoid that. You can use system once with the cloud jobs and the hybrid jobs. Hybrid jobs run on a hybrid worker. And you can use user uh, assigned managed identities only against cloud jobs. Okay? That's the rule for now. They are recommended. And as I said, Run as accounts still are available on the automation accounts that you provisioned already, but you will need to migrate soon. The sooner, the better, okay? The managed identities open some new uh, functionalities uh, for us. And first, I will actually show you how, let's go to the run books, and I will show you the one that it's created for us to make it easier. So here we can go with the view, and you can see that the whole thing that you need to do is this. Just copy-paste this at the beginning of your script, replace the previous one, and you are good. After you assign the roles, okay? This is also something that opened an easy way to manage Microsoft graph resources from Azure. But for now, you need to use the V2 version of Microsoft Graph PowerShell SDK that it's still in preview because that's the one that supports dash identity, okay? And I will show you just how the run book looks like, that it's really easy, that can, sorry, that can, Give me a list of all the users in my tenant. That's all I need. Connect mggraph-identity. That's what I need in my script. But where is a trouble? Where is the hard part of this? What do you think? Exactly. Scopes and permissions. Why? Because there is no way in a portal to enable the scopes for managed identity that represents Azure Automation. 
So PowerShell there to help, okay? This is what we will use to fix the problem. And I will give you a code and show you how to do it. So first part of, of this here is not actually about setting that up. It's more to show you that I'm using here non-interactive login to Microsoft Graph to set things up. I'm using the application that I have created. I assigned Microsoft Graph scopes to that application, and I use that application then to non-interactively log in to my environment using the app-only access, not delegated one that will support the sign-in user, okay? So those are the, the steps that are needed. And uh, I'm kind of using first Azure PowerShell a little, creating a credential. And important part here is that I need to force my system to import module that it's 2.0 preview because that's the one that supports client secret credential parameter. If you have Microsoft Graph 1, then you will not have support for this credential and the command will fail. So this is needed. For now, once when they have that, uh, I will have only the stable version of V2, and I will not need to uh, kind of uh, force this system like this. After I have that, then we need to do this part. We need to get the, to assign the app role to the managed identity of automation account. In this case, the permission is user read all because in that run book, I only wanted to get information about uh, display names for users. So I needed to find the ID for service principle that represents the automation account. Then I needed reference to a Microsoft Graph service principle. I will show you code here, also it's a very well known ID, okay? This ID here, 00003 and all those zeros and some C in between, it's always like that. Microsoft Graph always contained that thing, but you don't need to remember it. PowerShell is there to help you to find it, really, right? So that's what we do. Then we need to turn this permission name into the ID, actually, that the uh, new MG service principle app role assignment will understand. Okay, because Microsoft well, Graph people are weird and they like IDs and GUIDs. <laughs> they live in GUIDs, right? Their brain is different. You know? <laughs> if, you pay, if you pay attention, it's kind of coming closer to people that are really good with the regular expressions, right? So it's kind of battle between them. They're, they're a little bit strange. <clears throat> but really, IDs everywhere in, in Microsoft Graph. So this is kind of a new scenario that's interesting and I think it, opens a, a kind of a ask for a new feature, right? For uh, Azure Automation or for Azure team to enable us to find easier way to actually assign scopes to manage identities because uh, lots of people are complaining that this is kind of a too hard for them, really, right? They are not very good with, with PowerShell and then they have issues to uh, do that stuff. So, uh, I have seven minutes still. So source control uh, is enabled now with the manage identities. What is uh, important to understand here that it's a single directional, okay? So if you update stuff in a GitHub, those run books will go into Azure Automation. But if you go to a portal, change something in Azure Automation, that will be not synced to your GitHub repo. It's not bi-directional, just be aware of that. So you need to be very careful what you are doing, actually, really, right? The syncing is done by a process dash source control webhook, which is internal RAM book. You don't know that code. No. You can only see it when you, when you look at the job history of Azure Automation, you will see that it's mentioned there. You can see what are the input of webhooks parameters, like all of that stuff, but you cannot play it. And Big limitation, if you ask me, only runtime 5.1 for now is supported. So everything will 
go to the file, file one, not seven, right? Which is kind of a, a little bit of an issue here. And when we talk about this uh, source control, I want to uh, show you, okay, I made a mistake here. I could go here, but so one other thing that is really huge and, and very nice that, that happened is that finally Azure Automation team created Azure Automation Visual Studio Code extension. So we don't need to work in a browser or copy paste stuff or stuff. So it was already kind of a nice that we have that integration with the GitHub or DevOps repo so you can work in a VS Code. You can then uh, <clears throat> sync with uh, your GitHub repos and stuff and then they will go up. But this extensions is even better. Just be aware then when you work with those things is that you need to kind of follow a couple of steps to have a nice experience. So those are the steps that I recommend. Create first a local file when you want to store your uh, scripts. Then install the extension to Visual Studio Code. Once you do that, you need to go to a settings for settings. Okay, so I'm now confused. Where am I, to be honest? So settings, I got a kind of a different view of things, and then extension, and you, you go to Azure Automation, and here, you def oh, sorry. You go to Azure Automation, and first you define a base path, but after that, for some reason, Azure Automation insists that we need to have some sound folders, and you can only pick the format of those subfolders, which I don't really understand. It kind of will make it a little bit more, I don't know, too deep for me. I would rather have one folder when I do stuff, so I need to change my habits, and that's always bad, when you need to change your habits because they introduce a new tool, really, right? So just be aware, a base path, and what I pick here is this way of VS Code automation slash some GUIDs because I didn't like in my path to have information about the GUID of a subscription and the resource group and all of that, because that would need to go to a settings in Azure Automation when I establish connection, okay? But once when you do this, then you know where you need to put your scripts actually so that they are synced with the GitHub repo and you can still kind of continue to work there. Once when you install this, uh, uh, Extension, this is what you will get. You'll get Azure Automation that gives you a bunch of your automation accounts with access to a, a hybrid RAM of workers, with the RAM books, with the schedule, with modules and all that stuff. So you can nicely continue to kind of work in an environment of Visual Studio Code. And once when you are done, it's up to you actually how to interact with the Azure Automation. You can immediately upload those things up or you can use the GitHub support in VS Code to transfer those things to a repo, which I recommend, and then they will be published if you want it. This is part of the setup. They will be published to Azure Bay. So you want to have like a single source of truth, really, right? And just use VS Code as a convenient way to write your code, be IntelliSense and all the other stuff, really, right? But it's really kind of a nicely going with, the, with all these things. I, I really am happy how things work. I, I work with the beta version of this uh, extension and uh, it was not that good, but they put a lot of effort and made it much, much better. Yeah. So I still have a couple of minutes to talk to you about Habit Worker Extension, which is a new way of promoting machine to be a habit worker, much easier than with the agent. You practically need to create a hybrid runbook group, and in a moment when you add machine to a group, the extension will be practically added behind the scenes, and you will get everything established without any efforts. Amazingly good. Super works with uh, Azure VMs or Arc enabled servers, nicely with a Linux, with a Windows. Okay? Great stuff. So I, for example, have here 
in a in a my environment, a hybrid worker. Let me just close this and go here, here. Hybrid worker groups for my Linux machines, and I have one Azure Linux machine that is a hybrid runbook worker. For that machine to execute PowerShell runbooks, you need to install PowerShell 7 on it. Okay? There is one thing that you I want to mention to you that kind of a, uh, costed me some 50 minutes of my life is that when you add a module to that machine, because you have full control on it, right? When you add a module on it, by default, module is installed in a current user scope, okay? But the run books are not running in that, let's say, demo user. They are running as a root with some HWE automation account. So what you need to do to have it really working, you need to install the module on that Linux machine using sudo to start PowerShell, dash command, install module that you want for all users. Because if you try to install it for all users as a standard user, that will fail, okay? So just pay attention there. You need to install it for all users, sudo, psh, dash command, and then install module, all users, and you're good. So that's important thing, otherwise you will be asking yourself, where is my module? I just installed it, and it's not visible, really. It doesn't work. So pay attention to that thing, and that would be the demo. And thank you for being here with me. <laughs>